Hello, Oodles and Oodles, we're back yet again. Just finished another video. Just continuing on because I'm such a hardworking gal. And as I said in video before, -o, I wanted to do a review of book four of Jim Bircher's Judah Blah Blah. Jim Butcher's Codex Alera series. So the Captain's Fury. I, of course, if you haven't seen book one, book two, and book three, uh, seen it while I, I'm not speaking well. I'm not speaking. If you have not read book one, book two, and book three of the Codex Alera, go do it now before watching this review. If you don't, or if you did, Watch my reviews, book one, book two, book three, and then you can come and watch this review. As usual, I am going against the goddamn YouTube algorithm and doing reviews of entire series because I frankly don't give a shit. I don't know why I did that. I'm not religious. Anyway, what am I going to say about this book? What am I going to say that I have not said already about this series? I love this series. I love it. It's awesome. It's fantastic. End of video. We're leaving. We're gone. No, I'm kidding. We're staying. We're staying because I think this series needs more acclaim. It needs to be talked about more. People either only talk about new novels or they discuss the the more well-known, the more famous. And this, this novel, this series, is a best-selling series. Jim Butcher is a famous author, of course, but The Dresden Files sort of eclipsed this series. It is so good in that there's nothing ever bad happening in this series. Jim never screws up once. Is it the most like heart-rending, incredible series that has ever been written by mankind? No, but it's so damn consistently good across the board. By the fourth book, there should have been some slog, some slowdown. You should feel a little bit bored with the character. No, you're not. Jim has just written a world, has written characters that consistently never annoy me. And trust me, most book series have characters that do things, say things that are annoying. Not just because a character is meant to be annoying. Some characters are meant to be annoying. But there are a lot of series that have characters that are extremely frustrating to read. Wheel of Time being one of them. I love the Wheel of Time. But Robert Jordan wrote multiple characters that made me want to punch myself in the face. I would just be sitting there enraged because the way he had set up the novel was one, so that characters would just never, ever, ever get information flowing between each other. There was no reason not to. It was just purely because the characters were so hard-headed, so stubborn, so just unattractive as people many times, or at least having multiple instances in which they were just being idiotic, that the characters never communicated well. And I would lose my shit because tons of stuff happened that didn't need to happen. Now that can happen once. That can happen twice. When you have a 15 book series, that basically this happens a times. times. It's, it's ugh, you know, drove me nuts. This doesn't happen here. Do you have some characters that sometimes you'd want to punch in the teeth? Of course, but they're written that way. You appreciate what they bring to the moment, to the story, to the development of the main character or the characters around him, to the world. Everything serves a purpose. I guess one of the Bit, the best things, the biggest things about this series is that it's fluid. The flow of it is incredible. It never stops. If you're not getting character development, you're getting action. If you're not getting action, you're getting drama. You're, you're, there's always something going on, and it always serves a purpose. Characters don't suddenly do 360s and stop acting like they would have or sh and should have. Because we've seen the character be a certain way. There's not things happening that make zero sense. It's consistent across four books. And there's two more. Two more books. 
and I'm pretty sure it ain't going to stop at book four. It is just one of these series that you can read, and because it is so well written, it is so easy to read through. You're never stopping and having to take a break. You're never, you know, confused at any point. You always know, like, the size of the cast, the the amount of characters is never too much. It's always slowly building up. You're introduced to people in a way that it never gets confusing. You never have to be there like thinking, should I take a notepad out and write down who all these people are? Because I'm getting confused. Because that, that should only happen if one, too many characters are being introduced too quickly or two, many characters are being introduced but they serve no fucking purpose. I don't need to know who these people are. And that happens a lot in novels. That happens a lot in larger series. That does not happen in the Codex Solera at all. I know who everybody is. I know them enough that their characters being introduced to me make sense because they develop the backstory to one of the characters, the main characters, or they're helping develop the world and showcasing really how messed up things are. And in book four, things get really really messed up not that they weren't messed up in book one and in book two and in book three but the butcher is managing to constantly increase the level of difficulty in the game <laughs> without making it overwhelming or seem ridiculous that just one thing after another keeps happening because they're all so well interconnecting and building up on one another that it never seems like oh this makes no sense like how can things just keep happening no no it makes sense. You see how it all flows in and out of itself within the, the, the larger storyline. So it's just really great. The action, of course, is even more impressive. Tavi or uh, Octavian or Scipio, as he's known for <laughs> some of this book, is, is one of the most interesting characters in that he goes through such interesting character development without it being sort of this emotional bog down in his mind. And the people around him are fascinating enough that they keep everything going forward uh, without taking up too much room. So you never really spend much point of view time with anyone really besides Tavi and his aunt Isana. You do of course follow along with other people, but the vast majority of this book is spent with Tavi and Isana and of course Amara and Bernard. So main point of view is really Isana, uh, Amara, Bernard, uh, and um, oh wow, I'm blanking on myself. Amara, Isana, and Tavi. Those are really have been your central points of view for pretty much these whole four books. You get little glimpses of other people. Of course, Fidelius is still very much a central point of this storyline, and he's becoming more and more vague in his where he's going to end up, we'll say it as that. There's, it's kind of difficult to say more without ruining parts of the story. But uh, you're really just, for, for a four-book series to give us pretty much only three points of view while maintaining a relatively large cast around those three characters and making those people develop well without ever having point of views and making you really care about those people and care about the world through them is really, really great. And of course, as I said before, the action just keeps on improving, whether it's militarily, large-scale battles, or small-scale battles, or just one-on-one -on -one battles that are happening with our characters. We're starting to see more and more of Tavi, of course, having to be in physical altercations by himself. There's a phenomenal fight at the end of this book. That's just really, really great. I, I love how... Jim just developed the characters. Gaius gets a little bit more showcasing this book, not that he hasn't throughout the other three books, but you really get a lot more of a view of Gaius as a person in this novel. And there's a nice, nice twist at the end that really helps develop his character, but also his relation with Tavi and as, with Amara as well. So that was really, really nice. We really start to see... Uh, Jim has created a character who's very kind of on the line between, I don't want to say good and evil, but more so good and morally ambiguous. He, he's really, really in the gray zone, and he's, he's a phenomenally interesting character. I think Jim captured a, a sort of an emperor in a really great way, especially an elderly person who is still in the 
throes of being powerful but is slowly declining and so that was really well showcased and so yeah just the cast is great the action is great the environment and the world and showcasing of other races you get to know a lot more about the Kanim in this one of course it started in book three but book four really expounds upon that and you're really starting to see more of the Kanim kind of mindset and how different it is comparatively to most humans and how it changes and shifts depending on the moments and so they're a fascinating species and we're going to get to see even more i think in book five so that's really really great the marat of course are still cool i, I just love the marat they're really really awesome and katai is probably one of the best side characters i suppose you would call her she is the partner and she's so intrinsic to our main character tavi's life and yet she's just this bedrock where her character doesn't really need to be developed that much because of how Marat are. So that was a great way for Jim to make a lover for Tavi that would just also not be someone too overly complex that we, we would have to get bogged down in her storyline as well. And that allows us to actually focus more on Asana who's, who's going through such a huge shift in her own life that that makes it kind of nice that we, we're not wasting time with Katai. Not that it would be bad per se. I think it would actually be kind of interesting to spend a lot more time with Katai. But I don't want to be bogged down by too many characters. I've had that happen with too many series and it gets frustrating after a while. So, yeah. If you're reading this series and you're maybe hesitating after book three, I would again recommend pushing on to book four. I think things keep developing really, really well. And I think you'll enjoy it. If you're someone who has not read the series yet, you've decided to just randomly check out the book four review. Maybe you didn't realize this is book four of a series. I would highly recommend checking out book one and work your way through. This is a series that I feel like any reader can come into. You could be someone who's used to reading YA novels. You could be someone who's used to reading much, much larger, more epic scale, complex novels. You could be someone who doesn't really read that much at all. The flow of this series and the pacing and just book for itself is just really, really fun. It's easy. And this is kind of a comfort series. I think it's, 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 it's just something that you can read at any point in your life and just find something to enjoy about. So I will stop fanboying right now. And let me ask you to let me know what you think down below. Uh, you know, like, comment, subscribe, the whole usual spiel. Check out the website at geektales.ca. And I will continue to fill out this bookshelf with more books because it is really empty right now. Sad. Sad life. I don't know, maybe to some people this would be a lot of books. To me, this is actually very little. I'm going to keep buying more. I've got tons of books on Kindle, so I'm actually going to start going through my Kindle and really think about the books that I would like to have physical copies of and start ordering them. It's so expensive for books these days, but I suppose that's only because I'm nostalgically remembering how much cheaper it used to be when I was younger, but of course prices change, time change. Physical books unfortunately are not as prized as they used to be, so as they become less prized and people stop reading, which is a really unfortunate side effect of modernity and the internet and how people have habituated to reading. Uh, I think a lot more people still are, are going to go into Kindle as well, which is fine. I think there's a lot to be said for Kindle. There's a lot of benefit to that. Um, and it is cheaper than buying physical copies, but there's something about paper. I love paper. <laughs> something about the feel of it, the look of it. I guess it's like art. It's like tattoos, really. I, I used to try to explain why I liked having tattoos, and eventually I just realized it's like my clothing. I just have a sense of style that includes tattoos, and I like it. And there's something about having books in my room that I can pick up at any moment. It's just easier and nicer than a Kindle. Let me know, like I said, down below what you guys think. If you don't want to, it's fine. It's cool. I'll only cry a little bit. Yeah. Enjoy your day, fellas. And fill. Lady. What is the female version of fellas? I guess it's just ladies. Maybe let me know down below also. Farewell. <laughs>